The Bone Collector's Son by Paul Yi. This is another another of the many wonderful books set in Vancouver's Chinatown. This is set in 1907. And uh, Bing is the son of Ba who is employed to dig up the uh, bones of a Chinese person who has died in Canada and uh, bundle them up and send them back home so that they can be buried uh, with their ancestors. And they have just dug up a, uh, a corpse, well, not a corpse, a dismembered skeleton from a grave. It's been a long time, uh, but there's no head. And Ba says there is no such thing as ghosts, but Bing is not so sure. By the time the streetcar screeched to a halt near the cemetery, the sun had dropped below the treetops. Two lines of steel rails ran along the center of a road that cut through the dense forest. The line stretched north all the way to downtown Vancouver and south to the river at New Westminster. Bing scrambled to his feet, the heavy pickaxe in hand and the shovels tied with sturdy ropes to his back. He felt glad to be finally heading back to Chinatown. After Ba hoisted the bulging sack of bones onto the streetcar, Bing followed, shovels clanking. They took seats at the back. Bing leaned the pickaxe against the bench and slid to the window as the ticket collector approached them. Would the driver have let us aboard if he knew what was inside Ba's sack? Bing wondered. What do people think he's carrying? Corn cobs? He wanted to jump up, point at Ba, and shout, Look, that man, he's carrying human bones in a bag. Women would faint and children would scream, while men scrambled helter-skelter for the door. The conductor would throw Ba and his bones off the streetcar, and he would have to walk all the way back to Chinatown. That thought brought a broad smile to Bing's face. The streetcar lurched forward. The engine hum surged loudly and then died with a sudden click. The car stopped dead in its tracks. Bing stood up, but all he could see were women's hats decorated with flowers and feathers, turning from side to side. He poked his head out the window. Has the trolley pole slipped off the cable, he wondered? He had leaned halfway out the window before he could see that the trolley pole was still properly connected to the electric wire above. Stupid fool, get your head back in here, Ba growled. The broom's all right, the ticket collector shouted to the driver, who fiddled nervously at his gears and pedals. Fetch me a good horse, grumbled a passenger, fanning himself with a boater hat. A man never wastes his time riding a horse. They'll need a team of oxen to pull this car to the station, said another, checking a pocket watch chained to his vest. All the passengers were annoyed, and their voices rose with impatience. The next car will arrive, Bing thought, and it won't be able to go any further until our streetcar is moved. We'll have to sit here sweating with a canvas sack full of human bones next to our seats. What's the matter with this streetcar? Ba swore in Chinese. Can't they get it to run? Bing watched the ticket collector tug at the cable connection, connected to the trolley pole. He broke the connection between the pole and the wire and then gingerly swung the bobbing pole back into place. It took several tries to get proper alignment, but when the motor didn't stir, he banged his fists on the side of the car. Ladies and gentlemen, called the driver, I'm sorry, but I'm afraid I have to ask you all to get off. That sparked a commotion. This is outrageous, someone shouted. Is the company sending carriages, demanded another person. I demand you refund my fare, said a third. Can't you fellows fix this, asked someone else at the same time. We have to get off, Bing said loudly in English to Ba, as he seized the pickaxe and stumbled out the door. I'll show them I don't have to ask another Chinese to translate for me everywhere I go, Bing thought. Ba followed with the bag of bones on his back, swearing furiously. Who wants to sit in this old broken thing? As soon as Ba's feet hit the ground, Bing heard a loud crackle, followed by a steady hum. He looked up at the streetcar. The power had returned, and the car pitched forward as its wheels bit into the rails. Hey, shouted Ba, wait for us! But the car sped away, rumbling smoothly over the track. Bing and his father were left behind. Bing dropped the pickaxe in a shady spot under the trees. He was hot and tired and thirsty. No water was left in their jars. The shovels on his back were getting heavier. A mosquito circled his ear, and Bing flicked his fingers at it. Going anywhere with Ba always turns into a disaster, Bing thought. 
Ba stumped over and set down the sack of bones. Those bastards, they just don't want Chinese riding in their car. Good thing we hadn't paid our fare yet. There was no electricity, Bing pointed out. No power? How did the car get going? Ba lifted one hand to cuff him. Bing pulled back to a safe distance. The electricity starts and stops all the time. Even at school, the lights go out every now and then. That's the way it is. You think you're so smart, don't you? sneered his father, but he lowered his fist. Bing looked away. No use even talking to Ba, he thought. When the next streetcar rolled toward them, they clambered on. Again, they found seats at the back, but just as the driver released the brake, the power died abruptly again. A grim silence settled over the car, and Bing felt a chill creep up his spine. He glanced over at Ba. Doesn't he find this coincidence a bit strange, Bing wondered. But Ba was simply leaning back with his arms crossed over his chest and his legs sticking straight out. The passengers muttered fitfully to one another as the ticket collector jumped off to adjust the trolley pole. Bing watched him strain at the taut rope and thought, Maybe the cable is worn at this spot. Maybe the electrical current isn't running properly here, and that's why both streetcars have stalled. Or maybe it has something to do with the bones. A motor car honked its horn and roared past them, leaving behind a cloud of dust. The people on the streetcar covered their mouths and noses. <laughs> Please be patient, the driver said. We'll have this figured out in a minute. Bing jumped, jumped to his feet and tugged at Ba. The conductor said to get off, Bing said. He had a plan. He did? Ba asked. Bing dragged the pickaxe off the streetcar, stood well away, and watched for Ba to come down the stairs. He waited to see if his theory about the bones was right. The very instant that his father's feet touched the ground, Bing heard a click as the electric current came alive and the streetcar sped away. Don't those stinking bastards want my money, demanded Ba. He set down the sack and cursed loudly. As Bing stared at the sack of bones, it suddenly tilted forward. He wanted to get as far away from it as he could. Do you intend to wait for the next streetcar? Bing asked worriedly. How else would we get home? Let's start walking. Stupid fool! Do you know where we are? Ba squatted and fanned himself furiously with his hat. Bing pointed at Ba's bundle. Both times, as soon as that sack of bones left the car, the electricity went right back on. His father scowled. Fah! Those whites! They just don't want Chinese riding on their streetcars. But I've gone to Stanley Park in New Westminster on the streetcar with Uncle John and James, and we never had any problems. Then the drivers on this route are the bad ones. Wait and see, Bing said confidently. As soon as we get on the next streetcar, the electricity will shut down, and then we'll get off, and the car will start up again. You'll see that I'm right. Ba shook his head and looked behind him, checking for the next streetcar. You're scared, that's all. Bing turned right away and charged along the side of the road. He was right about those bones. He knew that for sure. Stupid fool, you're crazy, do you know that? Ba shouted after him. A streetcar appeared from the opposite direction, from downtown. It clanged its bell in warning and passed Bing with a swoosh. He didn't look up. He wanted to get away from his father and that sack of bones. Hey, wait for me, called Ba. Bing marched on. He dragged the pickaxe over the grass alongside the road, but it became tangled in the weeds. The shovels banged painfully on his back. He rolled his shoulders and tried to shift the weight around. When his father's footsteps drew nearer, Bing crossed the road. Don't come near me, he yelled. I don't want to not walk near you. Ba cursed, but remained on the shadier side of the road, much to Bing's relief. Just keep those bones away from me, he thought. Something isn't right about them. Bing recalled another chi old Chinese ghost story. Two young brothers were sent to fetch firewood one day. They had been told to return home early, but had wasted time teasing worms from the damp ground. At dusk, a puppy ran by them. A girl with long hair came running after it. Come back, you bad dog, she called. Come back. But the little dog ran into the graveyard. Every time its owner drew near, it darted away. She chased and chased it, but it but fell and got dirty. The boys laughed and hooted at her. She gave them a pleading look. Won't you help me? What will you give us? The boys replied. The girl reached into her smock and held up two copper coins. Each boy grabbed one and started after the puppy. The dog raced around the round and round the mounds and the markers, and the brothers took care not to step on anything sacred. 
This made it harder to catch the dog, though finally they cornered it. But when they looked for the girl, she wasn't at the gate. They looked everywhere and called out for her, but she wasn't anywhere to be seen. So they let the dog go. When the brothers told their mother about the coins, she told them to take the pennies and throw them back into the cemetery. But it was too late. The next day, the boys fell ill and died at the very same hour. Hey, stupid fool, hurry! Buzz th shouts pierced Bing's thoughts. Bing pl glanced back and saw his father standing by a horse and wagon, waving his arms. What good fortune, Bing thought. It was Dent Head Fong, one of Uncle Wan's drivers, sitting high behind red hair. Bing had privately named the horse after the loyal steed of Guang Gong, the god of war. Uncle Wan and his men simply referred to the horses as the black one, the short-tailed one, or the one that limps. Ba lifted the sack of bones onto the wagon. He took the shovels from Bing and tossed them aboard. Then he bent close and whispered, Don't tell Dent Head anything. Don't mention the streetcar. If he asks why we're walking, tell him you were carsick and couldn't stomach the ride. Bing clambered onto the back as his father went to sit beside Dent Head. Ba had told many lies in his lifetime, but this was the first time he had instructed Bing to lie. Bing glanced at the sack of bones and shifted far away from it. Clearly, the bones were bothering Ba, too. Yeah.